And uh, thank you for joining us for an important announcement about Alberta's economic recovery plan. I'm glad to be here with David McLean, Alberta Vice President of the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters, joining us on this important day as we begin the fall sitting of Alberta's legislature. We all know how our province has been hit by a triple whammy over the last uh, 20 months, the global COVID-19 pandemic, plus the biggest contraction of the world economy in almost a century, and on top of that, last year's total collapse in energy prices hitting our province hard. But in recent months, we've begun seeing strong signs of economic recovery and growth. Last month, Alberta added 20,000 net new jobs, just as we did the month before. In fact, three consecutive months of significant job growth and some 90,000 net new jobs created so far in our province since the beginning of the year. This has led to Alberta gaining back all jobs lost since the start of the pandemic, and we are experiencing the second fastest job growth in the Federation. We're seeing major investments and growth in emerging industries across the province, like film and television, tech and digital innovation, clean technology, and so much more. Since introducing the film and television tax credit last year, Alberta has seen nearly a billion dollars of investment flood into our province for major big budget productions like, for example, HBO's The Last of Us. We've seen tech giants like Emphasis, Infosys, and Amazon choose Alberta to expand their businesses, taking advantage of our low taxes and our cost of living, along with a wealth of tech talent in our workforce. And there are more very exciting announcements to come in that industry, uh, together with the announcements of RBC and Rogers that they'll be establishing uh, large tech talent centers here in Alberta. But just two weeks ago, we learned that Dow Chemicals, one of the world's largest companies, will build the world's first net zero ethylene cracker right here in Alberta, a multi-billion dollar investment that will create thousands of high paying new jobs. This will likely be the largest single job creating investment in Alberta in more than a decade and the largest in Western Canada uh, in a decade with the exception of LNG Canada on the West Coast. And after enduring a total collapse of energy prices last year, our oil and gas industry is surging again with ATB reporting last week that oil production in Alberta has never been higher. In fact, we recently had the highest ever level of exports at 4 million barrels a day. And by the completion, uh, with the completion, I should, should say, of Enbridge's Line 3 expansion this month, uh, the discount on Alberta oil prices is low, with Western Canada Select prices trading at over $70 a barrel today. And just last Friday, I was on the phone with the CEOs of the major oil sand companies who assured me that that will be translating into additional job-creating capital investment uh, in, the, in the year to come. However, all of this growth, all of this good news has created a new challenge, a, a good challenge. As the economy rebounds and investment dollars are pouring back into Alberta rather than fleeing the province, we have to make sure that we have enough skilled workers to keep moving forward. Over the past month, I've met with nearly 20 major industry associations, in, in, which collectively include, and we've spoken to hundreds of Alberta's largest employers through their industry associations. All of them, all of these groups report that the single biggest challenge they are now facing is a shortage of workers, which I know is a paradox because we still have 8% unemployment. And our number one focus has to be getting those folks back to work. That means bringing this investment here and ensuring that we have a workforce in the future to, to address the challenge of economic growth. A labor shortage could stop our economic momentum in its tracks, which we must avoid. And that's why today I'm proud to be here with Minister of Labor and Immigration, Tyler Shandro, to announce a key part of Alberta's response to this developing challenge. And that's Bill 49. The Labor Mobility Act, which we're introducing into the legislature today, it will make it faster and easier for skilled professionals and trades workers who are certified in other Canadian provinces to get their credentials recognized here in Alberta automatically. If passed, this legislation will make it easier for workers like, for example, optometrists, engineers, accountants, vets, architects, dentists, tradespeople, and in dozens of other occupations to bring their expertise, 
their uh, experience, their education, their work ethic, and their families from across Canada to Alberta, no matter where in the country they earn their credentials. And, and let me pause there to say that the, the single greatest engine of economic growth and diversification of Alberta's economy in recent decades has been population growth, people choosing to become Albertans. Yes, people from around the world immigrating here, but also, of course, hundreds of thousands of Canadians who moved to, to great opportunity at lower taxes, a better, higher quality of life, they came to embrace the Alberta advantage. And we have a strong incentive to further knock down uh, barriers to mobility of skilled workers, and that's why we're introducing the Labour Mobility Act, which will affect more than 100 regulated occupations in a wide range of sectors across Alberta's economy. This will be a growth opportunity for job creators in sectors where there simply are not enough skilled Albertans. In turn, having the necessary skills and talent in our province will make Alberta a more attractive destination uh, for not just workers, but for investment and businesses. Because when I talk to companies like Dow, one of their primary concerns now is whether we will have enough skilled workers to actually meet the demands of growth. I hope this will also be the start of a broader national effort to knock down trade and employment barriers that hamstring Canada's economy to the tune of billions of dollars a year. Occupations are regulated inconsistently across Canada, creating a, a patchwork of credential recognition that holds back skilled and certified workers. Many of them face additional educational, examination, training requirements, basically red tape if they want to get a job in a different province. That's time, money, and talent that is wasted. In fact, internal barriers to free trade within Canada may cost our economy as much as 30, uh, sorry, pardon me, $130 billion a year, according to some studies, with barriers to labor mobility being uh, one of the costliest elements of restrictions within Canada. A recent uh, study that we commissioned from the C.D. Howe Institute estimates that improving labor mobility could add up to $2.8 billion a year to Alberta's economy. And an earlier Conference Board of Canada report uh, from 2015 estimated that Canada's, Canada's economy nationally could expand by up to $17 billion if we were to improve the country's learning recognition system. Now, back in July of 2019, uh, when I met with my fellow premiers, I announced that Alberta was going to take dramatic and bold leadership in promoting free trade within Canada, announcing at the Council of the Federation that we were unilaterally, unilaterally lifting 80% of Alberta's ex exceptions under the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, and all, including all of our exceptions on pro government procurement. And I did it to challenge the other provinces to follow suit. I also put them on notice that we were going to look at unilateral recognition of credentials for trades and professions issued by other provinces across the country. And that's exactly what we have done. That's led to the introduction of this bill here today. So I'm challenging my fellow uh, premiers in other provinces to uh, reciprocate what we are doing today. I'm sending letters to all provincial premiers, encouraging them to follow Alberta's lead in tearing down these barriers and unlocking the vast potential in Canada's workforce. Because if you can move between the, the, the nearly 30 countries of the European Union as a skilled worker without uh, running into uh, burdensome red tape, why can't you do it within the 10 provinces of Canada? I believe Canada's premiers must come together on this critical issue to strengthen not only our national economy, but the bonds of national unity. So the Labour Mobility Act just, is just one part, one part of our strategy to ensure that we have a growing skilled workforce as we enter a period of strong economic growth. Uh, this strategy includes the Jobs Now program, which uh, with a $200 million contribution from Alberta, brings us to the largest ever government investment in skills training in partnership with the private sector, and we'll be having an announcement in the days to come about its expansion. It's also in addition to uh, the skills for jobs agenda, where we are uh, 
uh, putting a much stronger emphasis in our high schools, at colleges and universities, our post-secondary institutions, on practical learning to prepare young people for the jobs of the future, and things like micro-credentials and, and apprenticeship programs, co-op programs, and experiential learning. It's also in addition to the Alberta Advantage Immigration Strategy that we ran on, uh, and which is reforming Alberta's immigration program, and there will be more news about that in the weeks to come. On top of our Fairness for Newcomers Strategy, which is uh, knocking down barriers to the ability of immigrants from abroad to get their credentials and education recognized to work productively here in Canada at their skill level. All of this is part of Alberta's broader economic recovery plan, a bold and ambitious plan to create thousands of new jobs and diversify our economy. And as I say, that plan is working. The majority of uh, economists have projected that we are leading Canada in economic growth and we'll do so again next year. We are attracting job-creating private sector investment from across the country and around the world to make Alberta's economy the most uh, competitive in North America. We're taking action to ensure that our workforce is getting the skills uh, for the 21st century and beyond so that every Albertan has the opportunity to choose their path, to grow our economy, to realize their potential. We're building on our strong foundation as a responsible and innovative energy leader and a major global source of high quality ag and forestry products. From rural broadband and once in a generation irrigation projects to shovel ready transportation and healthcare projects and schools, we're building the infrastructure we need for our future economy. And we're providing the tangible support that Alberta businesses and families need to get back to work and thrive as our economy recovers and grows. So today we're taking an important, I think an historic step to support strong recovery and future growth uh, by taking this bold leadership action effectively to tell our uh, professional regulatory organizations uh, to recognize immediately the credentials of people from across the country. So with that, I will hand it over to uh, Minister Chandra to offer more details. I think we'll also be hearing from uh, David McLean from the manufacturers and exporters, then we'll be happy to take your questions. Good afternoon. Thanks very much for joining us uh, for this important announcement today. As the Premier mentioned, this is about responding to, about adapting to the challenging economic times that we find ourselves in today. And it's never been more important than now to make sure, as a government, that we are doing everything in our power, making Alberta a magnet for investment, to break down barriers that prevent the free flow of labour and trade, and confront the looming labor shortage that we now see worldwide head on so that our economy can recover and grow. And the Labor and Mobility Act is going to be a critical part of that work. If passed, the act will help ensure that our economy remains competitive on a global stage. And it's going to help uh, ensure that we attract the necessary skills, the necessary talent for businesses and communities to grow for them to succeed. And it'll do that by streamlining our processes, reducing red tape, introducing clear and uniform legislative requirements for Alberta's regulatory authorities. More specifically, the Act will make uh, Alberta the first and, and the only jurisdiction in Canada to legislate timelines for registration decisions. Regulatory authorities will be required to look at applicants and give registration decisions within 20 days. And that means that if someone is certified as a professional and they submit the necessary documents and they meet all of the requirements, they can expect to get to work within one month upon applying. The Act will also require regulatory authorities to establish streamlined internal review and appeal processes within reasonable timeframes. Next, the Act will limit the, the documents required to evaluate, evaluate the credentials of an out-of-province worker to include proof of certification in a Canadian jurisdiction and any other documents stated in the regulation. Further, further to our commitment to transparency, the Act will require regulatory authorities to make information on required documents and fees available to the public. 
So, for example, regulatory authorities may post this information on their websites. And this is another step to help make sure that our processes in Alberta are seamless and clear. Under the Act, we are also outlining what actions and offences and their associated penalties would be. And this includes actions like failing to register eligible applicants or failing to meet the legislative process, uh, processing times. Together, these actions will significantly reduce red tape and create a streamlined, create a consistent and create a transparent approach for recognizing the skills, the education and the credentials of out of province certified professional workers. But rest assured, this will not come at the expense of maintaining Alberta's high professional standards. And that's why in cases where regulated occupations are significantly different from the same occupation in another province, recognition will be restricted until that distinction is properly evaluated by the regulatory authority. And this will ensure that out of province certified professional workers have the equivalent skills to perform that occupation here in Alberta. Public safety will always remain number one priority for us in this government. And when taken together, these actions will help Alberta to break down the barriers which restrict the movement of people and goods to our province. And this is critical to ensure that we have continuing, uh, con the, we continue to attract much needed investment to our province, which will support our economic recovery and our future growth. And this will support our ultimate goal to make Alberta among the fastest moving, freest economies in North America. And under the leadership of the Premier, Alberta has and will continue to take bold action to make this a reality. And finally, I'd like to echo the Premier in thanking Alberta's regulatory authorities for their input in this process and to, uh, for their support in the development of this Act. Alberta's government is committed to continuing this work together, ensuring that our economy meets the needs of our job creators and workers and all Albertans. Thank you very much. I'd like to now invite David McLean, who is the Vice President, Vice President of the uh, Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Uh, thank you, Minister Shandro. Uh, it's, it's great to be here today. Um, every year, CME mem um, surveys their, our, Cana our members, Canadian manufacturers and exporters, surveys our members, and we ask them what their top challenges are. What are the things that, that keep them up at night? And every year, the attraction and retention of skilled labor ranks as a top concern. And that's not a new thing. That's been decades in the making. Uh, the legislation announced today acknowledges that challenge. We applaud the Alberta government for making this move. Now, for our part, man manufacturers have done their part to diversify their workplaces, to attract uh, under traditionally underrepresented uh, groups to the, manu the field of manufacturing. Uh, we've uh, increased wages across the board uh, in a bid to uh, attract uh, the best and brightest from around the world. Uh, but it's still a challenge. And uh, manufacturers quite simply need any, every tool at their disposal to, to meet the needs of, uh, of growth, uh, to grow the sector in the future. Uh, so on behalf of Canadian manufacturers and exporters, I'd like to thank uh, Premier Kenny and Minister Shandro for bringing this legislation forward. And uh, we uh, wholeheartedly uh, support this legislation. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're now going to move over to a media Q&A. Uh, just a reminder to folks who have shown up in person, we do have a mic set up for you to ask your questions into. At that mic, please say your name, uh, the news outlet you're with, uh, as well as who you're directing your question to. Uh, and a reminder that uh, any uh, questions on the Labor Mobility Act related to it are under an embargo until that legislation is tabled in the House. Uh, and with that, we just have a couple of folks online uh, who are take first, and then we'll grab the folks who are here in person. With that, operator, can you please put through our first question? Our first question comes from Don Braid of the Calgary Herald. Uh, Premier, this is uh, not on the topic, but I'll ask it very quickly. When do you plan to proclaim the Recall Act? Uh, Don, some point in the next few weeks, we're uh, Justice Department lawyers are completing the draft regulations to allow for it to be proclaimed. And uh, I just got an update that they, they hope to be done within the next few weeks. So I hope sometime in November. Um, that was always our intention and uh, just waiting for the final draft of the reg regulations. 
Okay, Don, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, is, is this uh, uh, measures you're taking today, um, is it more imperative now that Alberta is like, for a long time, we didn't have to work too hard to get people to come here. But now it's harder, and people are actually net leaving in some places. Is this more imperative now than it has been in recent years? Well, I would say probably not as imperative as it was during the the last boom. I remember I was the federal employment minister in that period, 2013, 2015. And uh, as you know, there there were huge uh, labor and skill shortages across the Alberta economy. Um, and uh, I was trying hard then as the federal leader, uh, sorry, federal uh, minister to get provinces to uh, knock down these barriers for labor mobility. Uh, some uh, progress was made. Some progress has been made under the Canada Free Trade Agreement, under the New West Partnership Agreement, but it's not enough. And now as we are moving, I believe, probably into a strong and sustained cycle of economic growth, and we are hearing about labor shortages, not just in Alberta, but across the economy in North America. This is going to become an emerging challenge. Um, I, I really believe that part of the Alberta spirit is that we are free traders. Um, and that's why doing this unilaterally makes sense. In fact, the uh, conference board study, uh, excuse me, the CD Howe report that we released uh, earlier this year confirms that Alberta is a big net winner when it comes to interprovincial migration. Um, now, Don, I, I don't, one thing, one part of your uh, question there I, I don't necessarily agree with is the assertion that we've been losing people. In fact, last year in 2020, when we had the hardest hit economy in the country, um, we were, we saw actually the, the f- highest population growth. We were one of only two provinces with net population growth. It is true that I think we lost uh, something like 2,000 people on net interprovincial migration that year. Um, given the depth of the what I call double recession in 2020. I think that was remarkable. But what I'm hearing now, anecdotally, we haven't seen this confirmed yet in StatsCan data, but when I speak to, for example, the uh, housing uh, and, uh, the builders in in uh, Alberta, they're telling me that they, they can't build fast enough uh, for the new demand. And in fact, one of the Calgary's largest uh, developers told me last week that he estimates there's like 100 families every week moving here from Ontario and that housing houses are flying off the shelf, so to speak. Um, I think that a lot of that is being driven by uh, the, cost, the, the cost of living differential. You know, real estate prices have, have reached an absurd level in other places like Vancouver and Toronto. Uh, such that it's it's virtually impossible for middle class families uh, to buy a starter home, and and so I think uh, the the Alberta advantage on the cost of living, the cost of housing, will increasingly be a, a, fa- a, a magnet, as will uh, stronger levels of economic growth. So, yeah, I I, I think that this is, this is good timing for this. Uh, frankly, um, I wish this had been done some time ago. We had this legislation ready to roll in um, a year ago. But we decided to keep it on the shelf because we were still struggling uh, with the re- with the COVID recession. Uh, but we think the timing is optimal now that we're moving into a strong period of growth. Okay, we have time for two more calls before finishing all the folks uh, in, in line here. So, operator, can you please put through our next call? Ashley Joanno, Post Media. Hi, um, I think this is probably a question for the Premier. Um, You talk about wanting to streamline the process for what regulatory bodies need to look at to approve someone, but we haven't gotten any details yet about what that's actually going to look like because it'll all be part of regulations that haven't been written yet. Can you give me some sort of uh, sense or some sort of examples of what you're actually going to be looking for in these regulations and how they'll be different from what it looks like right now? Sure. Well, there are a lot of specifics in the bill, and I I hope we're we're providing that to reporters on embargo. I hope so. Uh, Let me just give you some of the specifics. Um, You know, first of all, Section 2 requires that the regulators, these are the professional trade regulators, uh, comply with uh, the domestic trade agreements in force. So that would include the New West Partnership as well as the Canada Free Trade Agreement. And we've never made this a statutory, a, a requirement in law for them to comply. I think that that, uh, that that's an obligation that's been on the province, but we really need to move that obligation onto the regulators who actually exercise uh, the authority over applicants for uh, credentialing. Secondly, um, we make it very plain in law now a regulatory body has a duty to carry out registration practices and decisions 
in respect of labour mobility applicants, those would be Canadians coming here, that are transparent, objective, impartial and procedurally fair. There's now a clear legal standard if this is passed that they've got to be uh, transparent, impartial and fair on those interprovincial uh, uh, migrants. Uh, Section 7 says that where a labour mobility applicant has provided proof of certification to a regulatory body and has met all of the other requirements, um, the body shall register that labour mobility applicant without restrictions, limitations or conditions. So this is basically saying that as long as the person submits the required pr proof of, 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 you know, a dentist comes from Nova Scotia, as long as they pr submit the necessary proof of their professional um, qualifications, that the Alberta uh, Dentist College must recognize that um, effectively automatically. And we put in very tight and specific timelines um, here in Section 8 that 10 business days after making a registration decision, um, they, the, basically it says, excuse me, uh, that the regulatory body shall within 10 business days uh, provide written acknowledgement of the application. Then they have 20 days after that, to, after receiving the application to make a decision and they have then maximum of 10 days to inform the person. So basically we're saying to the um, roughly 100 regulatory bodies for professions and trades in Alberta, you can't sit on the file for more than a month. You've, this is uh, moving what has sometimes been a, a six or a 12 month process down to a maximum of 40 days. So, um, and, and our, our, the clear direction in this legislation is, is like, and here's the point, when you're a, an Albertan and you, if you need, um, if you get sick in BC or Saskatchewan, you don't ask to see whether the doctor or the nurse is certified by their Alberta regulator. You just trust that other Canadian professionals are operating at effectively the same high and safe standard. And uh, so what we're saying through this legislation is, let's stop second guessing each other in Canada. There will be some um, areas that we still need to work on where professions in other provinces may have a significantly different scope of practice. You know, uh, the example of dental hygienists, I believe, in some provinces they can administer uh, an, an, a local anesthetic and in, uh, in other provinces they can't. So there may be some uh, need for, for a continued work on, on regulatory harmonization amongst the different uh, pr trades and professions. But basically, I think this is very specific with the maximum 40 day timeline between receipt of application and informing uh, the applicant. And Ashley, do you have a follow up at all? <laughs> And uh, this press conference has talked about the, how mobility will add uh, $2.8 billion to the province's GDP. But if you actually look at the report that you're pulling that number out from, what it talks about is if the cost of moving to Alberta declines by one-third of 1%, that's right. what would add to the GDP. So I, I guess I don't understand how shortening the timeline for a yes or no answer in any way decreases the cost of living. Can you explain well, what I meant? Well, the, the CD How, sorry, yeah, the CD How report that we uh, commissioned doesn't talk about, it's not about cost of living, it's about the transaction cost in moving. And if one of those transaction costs is that you can't get certified to work in your trade or profession, or it takes months or worse years to get that uh, approval, then obviously that's a massive cost. So if we can move from a um, uncertain, opaque uh, regulatory process to more or less European Union style automatic and reciprocal recognition of Canadian credentials, that will be a, a game changer. And by the way, you know, we are in a, not just a, a national, but a global uh, labor force marketplace increasingly. And if we can go out to workers across the country and say, Alberta it has the fastest and uh, easiest process to, to recognize your credentials from another province, that gives us a competitive advantage. I think I get the point on the C.D. Howe uh, estimate is it gives us a sense of, um, of just, first of all, how uh, real the gains can be for our overall economy. And, um, and I, I, uh, by the way, I would also point out that the Forum of Labour Market Ministers just issued a report uh, earlier this month, which really underscores what we're trying to do here today. 
They say that um, red tape and administrative burden leads to delays and increased costs for certified workers seeking labor mobility. Varying occupational standards negatively impacts a worker's ability to receive full certificate to certificate recognition in all provinces. And many uh, workers and employers are unable, uh, are unaware of labor mobility opportunities. And they recommend that the governments work with regulatory authorities to encourage the reduction and streamlining of labor mobility application requirements for certified workers. That's exactly what we're doing here. Okay, thank you. Uh, operator, can you please put through our last call? Chris Barco, Calgary Herald. Oh, hi, this is also a question for the Premier. Uh, Premier, uh, will you uh, be participating in any sense at all with the COP26 Climate Summit, which is going to begin at the end of this week in Scotland? And I guess I'm wondering whether you've had discussions with the federal government recently and, and what your position is on Ottawa's latest target tied to the Paris Accord, which I believe is a 40 to 45 percent GHG emissions reduction by 2030. Well, the answer to the first question, Chris, is no, uh, I won't be there. I'm, as you know, we are uh, still in a state of public health emergency, and so uh, we are not uh, traveling unless it's absolutely essential. Uh, and I think just one more politician flying into uh, a gab fest in, in Glasgow is not going to make any uh, meaningful difference. But obviously, we have, on the second question, um, expressed great concern to the Government of Canada about its ever-changing targets. What we've been asking for, and I've said this to the Prime Minister since uh, April or since May of uh, 2019, what we're asking for and what the Canadian energy industry is asking for is clarity uh, and predictability when it comes to climate policy and its implications on uh, our energy sector, the country's largest industrial sector. Um, what concerns us is they, they, they almost seem to be improvising their targets. And it's, it's very difficult, you know, as I always say to, to the Prime Minister and, and his, uh, his cabinet ministers, you have zero chance of achieving your uh, emissions targets, be they net zero or whatever, without uh, the, Al the Canadian, the Alberta energy sector uh, being full partners. And that's not simply going to happen by diktat. Uh, it's going to require cooperation. That's one of the reasons we made a, 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 a huge push for a, a federal incentive for carbon capture, utilization, sequestration technology uh, in the recent budget. We, been, we wait for the clarification, we're waiting for the clarification of who's in the federal cabinet um, to finalize the details of that. We are seeking a CCUS incentive which is at least as generous as the 45Q incentive that has massively expanded um, CCUS in the United States. We'd like it to be refundable, uh, stackable, uh, and also, of course, for it to apply to enhanced oil recovery. So th those are the kinds of very practical things we're working on. Just last Friday, I met with, uh, met virtually with the um, major oil sands producers who constitute uh, the Pathways uh, Coalition. These are the, and these companies collectively have committed themselves to a net zero emissions target by 2050. That's going to take massive investments in technology, game-changing technology. Alberta will be there to help and support that, but we need the federal government to be partners. Instead of just coming up with ever more uh, ambitious targets, we actually need a game plan here. We want to be willing partners, uh, but we, we, need, we, need, uh, we need to have a real dialogue with the federal government because every, it's like, uh, every other month they seem to come up with a new target. And uh, do you have a follow-up, Chris? Yes, it, it's a two-part, uh, Premier. Um, I'm wondering, will the province look at adopting either a new emissions reduction target itself or a net zero emissions reduction target? That's the first question. The second one is I just wanted to ask you about what the federal government has told you with regard to funds or assistance for energy transition, in other words, for workers who are affected by the energy transition and maybe uh, needing employment help uh, in the future years or decades to come. On the first question, um, yes, uh, we uh, later this year, uh, Minister of Environment and Parks uh, Jason Nixon will be uh, re releasing, publishing uh, Alberta's updated uh, climate strategy, outlining uh, our targets and strategies, uh, working with industry to achieve those. Uh, so stay tuned on that. Uh, secondly, with respect to 
uh, the so-called, the federal government's so-called just transition. I don't think there's anything just about telling 800,000 people uh, that uh, we don't value what they do and, and governments are going to try to undermine them and, and, and move them out of their high-paying jobs. So I fundamentally uh, uh, disagree with the whole premise of the federal liberal government's uh, so-called just transition. I'll tell you what, what is just is that the hundreds of thousands of jobs, high paying jobs, that have been created, we, we're here talking about labor mo mobility today. This, the message I convey to the Prime Minister and, and his colleagues is this, that Alberta has been the great economic re uh, pressure release valve for workers in other parts of the country who are facing unemployment and even poverty, for unemployed Central Canadian manufacturing workers, for unemployed Newfoundland fishery workers, for unemployed BC forestry workers, and so many more who came to this province. And instead of uh, facing the despair of underemployment or unemployment, uh, in many cases ended up generating six-figure incomes and having incredible opportunities here. That is the nation-building role that Alberta has pl played in Canada's modern economy. And what we see now is a growing energy scarcity across the world because of the kind of policies that lie behind the so-called just transition. As energy prices are facing uh, massive inflation that will drive more and more families in Europe and, and elsewhere into energy poverty, uh, we need to have a realistic discussion about this. Yes, we need to embrace new technologies to reduce emissions, and we, we are and we will continue to do so. But in a world where there is a growing scarcity of traditional energy sources, Alberta can be part of that solution. So uh, I kind of reject the premise of the whole uh, just transition for workers, and no, we haven't heard anything about them, about a strategy, about how you would, you know, uh, take hundreds of thousands of people in high paying occupations and uh, uh, we, we, we've heard nothing about that. I mean, we, 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 they did supply $200 million to match us on the Jobs Now program, which is a job training program, but we really see that as a bridge for people who are unemployed uh, to get into work. Okay, thank you. We'll now move to the questions here on the floor. We have Tom Vernon with Global News. Go ahead. Hi, Premier. I want to get you on the previous move you made when it came to internal trade, removing 80% of the exceptions. You challenged other Premiers to go ahead with that have any signal that they were going to? And if not, are we not putting Alberta businesses at a disadvantage? The answer, Tom, is uh, only one province did, uh, regrettably, follow our suit. That was Manitoba. They released, uh, they reduced a number of their exemptions uh, after Alberta threw out that challenge in 2019. Um, and I'm frustrated by that. I'm frustrated that we, we continue to live in an economically balkanized country where there's more free trade between the, well, I think, 28 member states of the European Union and the 10 Canadian provinces. I said to Prime Minister Trudeau when we first met in the spring of 19 that I thought the federal government had constitutional superpowers to knock down interprovincial trade barriers, and I would support them doing so to, cr to realize the dream of the economic union at, con at Confederation. Um, but the feds are not doing that. And so I do think, Tom, on your second part, it is clearly to our net advantage to knock down these barriers. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, particularly on procurement, you ask about procurement. So, yeah, we, we knocked down all of our restrictions on, on uh, procurement that were in the Canada Free Trade Agreement. Well, what that means is we get more competition bidding for work in Alberta, which means uh, lower uh, costs for taxpayers. That's, that's, a, that's a positive. Um, and, and finally, I, I would point out that... Um, Alberta is a major exporter of services like construction services with big companies here like PCL and, and, uh, and others. Um, and, and none of them have come to us to, to complain about taking a, a unilateral approach to this. I think they all realize uh, the benefits of Alberta doing this. Uh, and, and Albertans are not afraid of competition. I want to get you on the public inquiry report released last week. When you launched the public inquiry, you used language like knocking down misinformation. Uh, if any illegal activity is found, uh, directing the government to, or uh, directing action on that. In the end, there was no legal activity found. There was no attempt to find any misinformation. And in fact, what it found was all they were doing was uh, doing their free speech rights. Nothing was wrong. What did we get for $3.5 million? Well, uh, there's a difference between... Uh, illegal and wrong. There are a lot of wrong things that may be legal. And I think it's wrong. It's wrong for uh, 
billionaire foreign foundations to gang up on our economy. And, and, and th their campaign killed pipelines. Their campaign led to the loss of tens of thousands of energy jobs in this province. I think that's wrong. And that's why we threw the spotlight of transparency on them through the inquiry. I never uh, alleged, I never alleged that there was criminality here. I do think that there are, are a lot of questions about um, the uh, compliance with federal tax law for registered charities, uh, which is what, one of the reasons the Harper government uh, provided the Canada Revenue Agency with, I think, $10 million in the 2015 budget, um, better to investigate violations of the Tax Act uh, with respect to uh, illicit political activities supported by groups, by, by registered charities that are supposed to be limited in their political engagement. But then Prime Minister Trudeau came in and he instructed the CRA to down tools on that and then subsequently changed the law to allow registered charities to engage in, I think, virtually unlimited political work. So I guess retrospectively changing the charities law uh, to bail out his friends from the, the Green Left organizations made that work legal, but I don't think it makes it right. Uh, I don't think charity should be able to be basically um, a benefit from um, that the privileged uh, charitable tax credit while they're basically lobby organizations and, 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 and political special interests. Anyway, I, I think the Allen Inquiry did what we'd hoped it would do, which was to, th to, to look at the data, um, to, to uh, provide an objective and read on uh, the campaign to landlock Alberta Energy. They identified $1.3 billion that came from those organizations over that period of time. And, and I think it, it, it validates what we've been saying from the very beginning about the high degree of coordination of those campaigns. So at the, at the very least, what we have is a much greater degree of transparency. So we know what we're coping with. And I hope that those who are on the side of, of responsible development of our natural resources will learn some lessons uh, from the Allen Report. Thank you. Hi, Carly Robinson with City News. Uh, this will either be for the Minister or the Premier, whoever wants to take a stab at it. Um, when we talk about worker shortages, lots of Albertans will be thinking about healthcare workers and what we saw this summer. So I'm wondering how this legislation would have made a difference in this summer if it had been in place a year ago. Sure. Good question. So first of all, uh, Alberta does have, uh, on a per capita basis, more nurses and doctors than Canada, um, and they are generally better compensated than in other provinces. So uh, I in that sense, uh, we don't have, you know, we're, slight, we're somewhat better off when it comes to the total healthcare workforce here than other provinces. Secondly, all Canadian provinces have been coping with um, workforce uh, challenges, healthcare workforce challenges through COVID, m partly because so much of the COVID pressure has been on a relatively small portion of the, we have 111,000 employees at AHS, but we only have 850 registered nurses with ICU uh, experience. So uh, a great deal of the pressure has come down on that relatively small number of, of nurses, not just here, but, but elsewhere. I believe me, when I speak to other premiers, they're, they're all coping with this challenge. So um, we, we need to address that challenge in the long term. That's a mandate I've given to, to Minister Copping. I will note that um, Alberta, I'm, a, I'm ashamed to say this, Alberta, under the Canada Free Trade Agreement, has filed more exemptions on labour mobility than any other province, and a lot of those exemptions deal with nurses. So what we are doing here today will actually eliminate those exemptions effectively and, and allow for greater labor mobility in recruiting nurses. I'll just, I'll just share with you, one of the, one of the um, complaints that I get from other provincial governments is they say, you know, you and Albert have always paid ba better salaries. British Columbia and Saskatchewan nurses and doctors keep coming here as a result. Um, you know, I think we see we see those salaries and wages uh, coming closer together now. But we, do, we if if we if there's a nurse somewhere else in the country that wants to come in and work in Alberta, it will be easier after this legislation. Perfect. And you're uh, encouraging other provinces to do the same. So what's going to be done to keep our nurses and doctors now that the salaries are closer from leaving? Yeah. Now that that's open? well, I, I would say uh, we still want to offer generous and, and competitive rates. In fact. Um, uh, we are in collective bargaining with the Union of Nurses right now, uh, and uh, that is um, uh, 
Um, I, I, we, I can't comment further because we are in the midst of negotiations, but uh, we, I can assure you that we are doing that in good faith uh, and that uh, it's never been our goal to go below the national average of compensation, to, but, but to come somewhat closer to the national average because we have typically been paying a 20% premium. Um, so we will continue to offer very competitive and generous uh, levels of compensation uh, for our, our, our profoundly valued uh, healthcare workers. Um, and there are, of course, other benefits. I mean, if you're a nurse or a doctor in Alberta, um, you're living in a, uh, and, and you move to Toronto or Vancouver, you can expect to uh, pay three times more for the same house and pay higher taxes and have a higher cost of living. Um, so I, I, I think the value, a proposition of the Alberta Advantage speaks for itself. Okay, we have time for two more questions today. You can go ahead. Sure. Shailan Skalski, CTV News. Um, I just want to talk about the timing. Uh, Premier, you spoke about this process previously in regards to the bill. The process previously taking regulatory bodies six to 12 months. Now we're talking about 20 business days. I'm just wondering how much consultation was done with these regulatory bod bodies to make sure this was realistic and done without compromising the process. Fair, fair, fair question. So when I said six to 12 months, I said sometimes it can take that long. I don't, that's not an average. I don't actually know what, what the average is because you're talking about roughly 100 uh, regulatory Regulators of per trades and professions, and some of them, to their credit, um, have very good practices. Some of them are have are, are with the program in in trying to help it rather than hinder labor mobility. But that's not universally the, the case, and this sets a a standard across all uh, trades and professions. Now we have received some feedback in our consultations. A minister, former. Minister of, of Labor uh, Jason Copping and his department led consultations with the professional regulatory organizations last year. And, and some of them did say that they would prefer the flexibility they currently have to a kind of legal mandate and a legal timeline. Um, and their argument was that, that every profession is different and some have greater levels of complexity and they're the experts and they should know how long to take and what the process should be. Um, our resp we, we respect that, Our res and, and we're not saying there shouldn't be a process, but we're just saying um, there is, it, unless there's a really good reason to, to question the standards of another province, like they have a different scope of practice, this should be more or less automatic. And the model for this is what they do in the European Union. So, it, it, you know, if you're a physician from Poland, you move to the United Kingdom, uh, it's almost seamless. And, and I would just say, we have confidence of Canadian standards. When you go to Nova Scotia uh, on a holiday, you get a toothache, go to a dentist. You're not asking if they're registered in Alberta. So I'm not, I don't think this will in any way undermine uh, uh, Canadian um, occupational health or safety standards. And just a follow-up, uh, Premier, you spoke about 8% unemployment in the province right now. I guess, are you concerned that this legislation is going to edge those skilled Albertans that are un unemployed right now further out of the workforce? Well, one of the reasons we didn't bring this in last year is because we were still in double-digit unemployment, and um, and really people weren't moving during the the first year of, of COVID. Um, what we're seeing now is a totally different economic situation, and, and I think we're going to see employment continue to come down. We've seen nearly 60,000 net new jobs created in the past three months. Uh, every industry is reporting right across the economy at every skill level problems with getting people to to uh, to to fill uh, jobs. So we need to get we need to skate to where the puck is going, and where the puck is go growing is dynamic economic growth and labor shortages. I think this is the right time to do it. And uh, you can go ahead with our last question of the day. Mirna Jukic, Radio Canada. Um, vous avez mentionné que vous voulez aussi réduire les barrières à l'emploi pour les nouveaux arrivants de oui. l'extérieur du pays, euh, étant donné les pénuries de main d'œuvre auxquelles on fait face maintenant. Pourquoi ne pas les inclure dans cette législation-ci? Qu'est-ce qui doit être différent dans cette question? C'est une très bonne question. I'll just summarize in English. The question is, why aren't we doing the same thing for immigrants coming in as opposed to just Canadians? Um, on a déjà adopté une loi à cet égard en 2019 qui s'appelle the Fair Registration Practices Act. Ça fait partie de, de stratégie de, de justice pour les nouveaux arrivants, the Fairness for Newcomers strategy. Et alors, nous avons adopté une loi qui oblige les ordres professionnels de, de donner une réponse uh, vite, juste et transparente aux demandeurs de... De, de reconnaissance de, de leur titre étranger dès que possible. Et alors, on a créé même un bureau 
au, au sein du, du ministère de Ministre Chadro pour euh, surveiller le progrès des ordres professionnels euh, à cet égard. Et euh, alors, euh, euh, c est, c est notre, notre stratégie, it's called the Fairness for Newcomer Strategy and the Fair Registration Practices Act. Et écoute, euh, on est ouvert aux mesures supplémentaires à cet égard euh, parce que nous ne voulons pas gaspiller le, les talents, les habilités des immigrants euh, des autres pays. Euh, C'est pour moi... Le, le, le contexte des, des, des médecins qui sont chauffeurs de taxi, c'est un scandale moral, un gaspillage économique euh, épouvantable pour le Canada. Il faut le régler. Et nous sommes ouverts aux autres mesures. Effectivement, la semaine dernière, le gouvernement de l'Ontario a déposé un projet de loi euh, pour les mesures euh, 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 sur cet enjeu. Et j'ai demandé à ministre Chandro d'étudier le projet de loi en intérieur pour voir si on peut répliquer certaines de, de leurs nouvelles politiques à cet égard pour accélérer la reconnaissance des titres étrangers. Go ahead with your follow -up. Si je peux enchaîner sur un sujet un peu différent, oui. à, à l'aube de la session législative, on vous entend beaucoup parler de mesures pour la reprise économique, mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut s'attendre au niveau de la gestion de la pandémie en tant que telle? Est-ce qu'on va voir une levée des restrictions comme l'Ontario en a déjà annoncé? Là? Écoute, euh, aujourd'hui, nous commençons euh, la session de la législature. Euh, évidemment, la gestion de la crise de santé publique euh, n'est pas vraiment une question de législation, c'est une question de opérationnel pour le ministère de Santé. On va évidemment quotidiennement nous continuer à travailler à cet égard. Nous sommes heureux d'avoir une diminution de pression sur les hôpitaux et des nombres de nouveaux cas. On va continuer avec les règles que nous avons maintenant dans le contexte de euh, période d'urgence, de, de, de crise de santé publique pour, euh, pour euh, les semaines à venir. Euh, le euh, le métrique, le, 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 le nombre que je suis il, est le nombre total des, des, des patients dans les, les lits de soins intensifs. Il faut que ce nombre-là soit moins de 172. Ça, c'est le nombre normal des lits de soins intensifs. Alors, maintenant, nous sommes à, je crois, 270. Alors, il faut voir une, une diminution dans les semaines à venir dans le nombre des, 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 des gens dans les soins intensifs avant que nous pu puissions euh, euh, relaxer euh, les, les règles de santé publique. So I'll just maybe translate that in English. Uh, I was asked in the last question about um, what we're doing on, on public health uh, with the fourth wave, which is diminishing. And effectively, I said that... Um, that we intend to maintain, first of all, there's really no legislative um, aspect to the management of COVID at this point. It's an operational uh, and regulatory issue. Um, and uh, we obviously continue to, to follow things uh, hour by hour. We're happy to see a decline in hospitalizations and in new cases, um, but we will not be considering a, a relaxation of public health measures until uh, the total number of intensive care patients is below our baseline of 172. Right now we're at about uh, 270 to 280. So we will be maintaining our current policy setting with respect to um, uh, limiting viral spread uh, and of course increasing vaccination rates at least until we get uh, to a point where we have uh, a sustainable uh, uh, pressure in terms of intensive care in our hospitals. Thank you very much. Okay, and just a reminder one more time to the media that uh, matters related to the labor mobility